Cool. Hey, everyone. Thanks for coming today. We'll get started uh, now anyway, and people can trickle in if they come in a little late. My name's Tom. I'm a senior product manager at Microsoft. I am in charge of user and people experiences for Office. So my division uh, that I work with covers all of the user experience, the interface, how end users and admins interact with the product, and then right through to how people actually authenticate and sign in and the experiences that we're able uh, to essentially empower and enable users uh, with how they use the product and where we're surfacing their information. And today we're going to quickly have a look through um, identity as a topic. Uh, how many people in the room here are familiar with managing corporate identity or organizational identity? A couple? Cool. So this is going to be a, a fairly introductory session. We'll touch on some pretty advanced topics because uh, identity can be a really advanced topic. Uh, but what we're going to do is go through, just understand where identity came from uh, as a concept, how we manage it, and then some of the things that we're working towards at Microsoft and uh, where we're going to go over the next wee while. So we're going to go through why we care about it. Uh, we're going to look at a couple of global considerations for anyone that might have users or employees that sit outside of the US as well. There's some pretty big implications of that. We're going to go through some of the tools that are necessary to manage your organization's identity. Um, and we're going to look at what's next. Now, identity is really interesting because you can't do anything with Office 365 until you've decided how you want to manage your identity. And we will have some default ways that we think you want to use it, and we will sort of remove those barriers to entry if we want to. But really, this is something that you want to be proactively thinking about whenever you're moving to the cloud or whenever you're uh, managing a cloud service to make sure that your information is secure and protected and in the right place at the right time. So what is identity? Why do we care? Well, uh, when people move to the cloud, they're essentially looking for a couple of different things. They're looking for a service that's always up to date. You want it to be easy to maintain. You want it to be scalable. Uh, and when we remove the tools from that side of the equation, that's take out PowerPoint and Word and Outlook and your email and things like that, the service itself essentially has one thing that it has to do. Uh, and that's to enable the right individuals to get the right resources or the right information at the right time and for the right reasons. And that's really what the cloud infrastructure that Office 365 is built on has to deliver. And we say, when we talk about the right individuals, we're saying, are these people in our company? Are they people externally? You know, it could be anyone that I work with or interact with on a daily basis. Uh, is it the right resources? Do these people have permission to access the data that they're looking at? Uh, how do they request permission if they don't actually have access to that data today? At the right time, when do you get the information? Making sure that you have the information when you need it or even before you need it. Uh, and on the right device as well. If I'm out of the company, if I'm on my phone, making sure that I can get access to that information as well. And then obviously for the right reasons. Do we think that the person is using this information for the right reasons? Is it potentially malicious? Uh, what are they going to do with this data? And how can we proactively identify that and make sure that the person uh, is not going to do something potentially dangerous with our data? And that's what identity enables. Identity is the cornerstone that underscores all of the experiences or productivity experiences in Office 365. Uh, it provides protection for information, so that's the right people getting the right resources, and it empowers people to do their best work by giving them the right information at the right time when they need it and on the right device for the right reason. So that's how we really think about uh, uh, identity. Now, I want to just quickly wind back and, and talk about where these two concepts came from and why they're super important. Because since the early days of communication, military personnel, commanders, everyone like that knew that protecting the information they had was really important. Uh, and it was necessary to provide some sort of mechanism not only to protect the correspondence, but also to detect whether or not it had been tampered. And for the most part, for a long time, that was achieved by just keeping the data with the right people, not giving it to everyone, making sure that those who had it were background checked. And then in 50 BC, Julius Caesar invented, because uh, he apparently invented a lot of things, uh, the Caesar cipher, which was to stop people from reading essentially the secret messages. Now, the Caesar cipher, probably many people in the, office, in the building here know what that is. It's a substitution encoding. And what that does is it takes the plain text and it moves it and replaces it with an alphabet, alphabet letter, a fixed number of positions down the alphabet. For example, in this one, we're talking about a right shift of six. That means that D would be J and K would be Q and so on. And so it's a very, very, very basic encryption. But it's still used today in a lot of different encryption technologies. In fact, this uh, puts down the base for hashing, which is what we do with passwords, which we'll talk about later on. And it's also used in things like uh, Rote 13, which is the way that we go about uh, salting and encrypting passwords as well. Uh, everyone knows that essentially uh, these sort of substitution ciphers are 
essentially useless today. Um, we have far more uh, strong and far better methods of communication and protecting information now. So as time went on, information protection matured. Uh, sensitive information began to be marked as sensitive, be classified as different levels of sensitivity. And with greater protection came smarter thieves. Postal services, for example, started to have inter intercepting messages and understanding and deciphering messages. We saw the infamous Enigma machine during World War II and the Germans that encrypted information in an almost unbreakable way with multiple ciphers. Uh, and then as we got to the birth of really networked performance and the introduction of ARPANET, which was essentially the beginning of the internet, we introduced the password or the digital password as it stands today. And for the most part, the password hasn't really changed. We've set more controls on the password, we've set requirements, but for the last 50 years, passwords have functioned as passwords. They are a key, a secret word that you use to get into and access information. And a decade ago, password theft seemed like something of, uh, that was really reserved to things like badly protected Hotmail accounts or your AIM screen name and things like that. Whereas these days, companies that hold our personal data, anyone from the New York Times to Facebook uh, to Twitter and Gmail have at one time in their past or in their history been hacked. And so the password is suddenly becoming a really outdated way of protecting sensitive information. Um, this is always a really interesting and really terrible thing to look at, and I don't know why my slides aren't changing here, but uh, you know, the m most common passwords that we have, I always find it really interesting that Dragon makes it to the list, uh, being number seven, but for the most part, people's passwords are password, or one, two, three, four, five, six, or QWERTY. So we're not really in a great place when it comes to uh, protecting information if this is the key blocker between a malicious party and your company's sensitive information. So we introduced um, OAuth, and this OAuth is a collective framework for information protection and control. Uh, really came out of a birth of a collaboration between Twitter and Google a number of years ago. And OAuth standards allow each of our security, uh, each of these secure services like Twitter and Facebook and Gmail and Outlook.com and Office to log in and share credentials with other services without actually sending your password to them. So a really great example of this is Facebook. When you log into the New York Times using your Facebook password, you're using OAuth. You're not, send, you're not giving the New York Times your Facebook password to use. You're using a dialogue window, and they, the New York Times is told by Facebook that you are who you say you are, and they let you into their content. And it's a much smarter and safer way for us to allow for this validation, because we're not just relying on the password anymore. We can put any number of authentication factors in between you and the data to make sure that it remains as secure as possible. So we're really at this point where we've got this OAuth standard for information protection. And in Microsoft, we call that modern authentication. But when it comes to the empowerment piece, we also need to make sure that we have the right tools that are there for you to be able to get the information you need and make sure that it's disseminatable. So if we look at where, um, where information dissemination came from, when we really look at it, back in the 1400s was when we had that first real explosion of information with the advent of the printing press. Uh, it was the first democratizing event really around, uh, around the world that gave every single person access to information. And it's really only spread, uh, spread from there. Every walk of life has essentially changed because of the knowledge distribution that we now have. And then this has also evolved, just like protection. We've had Web, web 1.0, you know, which is essentially referred to as the readable web. That's when I could read a website to get information. Web 2.0, that was when I could then reply and I could write on the web. And we're really now in this multidimensional collaboration form of Web 3.0, which is where I don't just want to reply to information, but I want to work in real time on executable uh, actions and documents and programs on the web. And evidence really suggests that we're already here in that Web 3.0 world. Employees work on two times as many teams as they did five years ago. 41% um, of employees say that mobile apps are used every single day in their business. Um, and with that, we also have 160 million customer records le leaked every 12 months. Uh, and on average, it takes about 229 days for you to identify that your records have been leaked. So that information protection comes with the information empowerment. We can't give people access to greater information without also improving those controls for protecting the information as well. So the way we work's changed. You know, my office follows me wherever I am. Um, Brian, who I work with, who's in the back of the room here, said something great the other day, which was, you know, I didn't used to be able to leave my, co leave my office in the coffee shop, which is so true. Now you can leave your phone unlocked in the coffee shop and walk off for five minutes, and everyone has access to all the data that you have. 
Um, we're no longer confined to our desk, though, which is also leads to greater productivity. Um, we're moving from a need-to-know sort of world to a need-not-to-know, where all the information is there unless I don't want you to have it. Uh, a really great example of this is uh, General McChrystal in Iraq and Afghanistan, how he found he was fighting a networked enemy. And they essentially said, how do we as a hierarchical organization ever attack an enemy that's able to share information and have these open lines of communication internally. And so they really switched the way that they operate from this hierarchical, structural, military type uh, organizational structure in Afghanistan to being a very much networked approach where information was marked up not for sharing as opposed to for sharing. And so we're moving this away. And identity is enabling all of these new scenarios, and we'll talk about how that happens. But essentially, where we used to have all the documents being siloed in one area and conversations in one area, we had people in groups that were internal or external and events that were limited to one person, is we now put the person at the center of what their identity is. Every person has sets of documents, sets of hooks and events and calendars and chats. And we want to make sure that th that person is able to access that no matter where they are, on what device they're using. And also, if I'm someone that wants to collaborate with you, that I can also get access to your documents when and where it's valid. It's this people-centric identity model. But people-centric identity model is, you know, comes with a little bit uh, of a catch. Uh, in the ideal world, where does it leave us? Well, everyone in here, I mean, show of hands, who here has maybe two, three devices? Uh, in total. Yeah, we find that on average people have between five to seven devices, which sounds insane to me. Uh, but all of those devices require a separate login. And then if you're accessing information on those devices, you need information, you need to not only access that device, but you need a password to go and access that information. And that might be on premise and some servers that you have in your office. It may be in the private cloud, it may be in uh, Windows, it may be actually in a public cloud. And you've got to have a password for each of those connections as well. As a business, you may have some managed devices. You might have some phones or some tablets that are specific to your organization, and you only want certain people to be able to access those, uh, those devices. And then comes the cloud world. You know, we have all these incredible cloud services that are essential to getting things done in the modern world. Uh, things like Salesforce, Box, Dropbox, SAP, uh, Dynamics, Dynamics 365, Office. All of these cloud applications also require individual logins for every single person to access. And in order for you to maintain those and make sure that your data protection rules, that your privacy rules are all applied to them, as an IT administrator, you need to be managing every single one of those services. Uh, that means that if you mark up information for as being high business impact data in one, in one application, and someone shares it to another application, that application may not respect those data privacy rules. It may not even respect that person's uh, password once it's changed, and they have to change their password in every single one. And that's where identity comes in. Identity is the cornerstone of essentially enabling all of these experiences to work seamlessly together. So where I have a login today, I could go and use that same login for on-premise, right up into my own servers, and I can go and use it into the cloud. I can use it for my software as a service providers. I can use it for Azure. I can use it for Office 365 as well. And we at Microsoft offer that identity service called Azure AD. So Azure AD is our cloud identity service that helps you communicate and add all of these, oh, sorry, add and seamlessly um, conglomerate all of these different logins into one seamless process. And I'm going to show you how we can quickly go through and add a new application to our internal company directory to allow for single sign-on uh, in one of the examples later on today. So what does your identity provide you? Well, as part of Office 365, you get Azure AD. So every time you sign up for Office 365, we create an Azure AD account in your name, and we add all of your users into Azure AD. So you get all of these advantages straight away. Single connection for all of these third-party things. So if you have Salesforce or SAP in your organization, go into Azure AD, add SAP, choose the hook so you log in with both, we authenticate that it's the same one, and then every single user that you decide has access to that application, gets provisioned into that application as well. If you change their password here, their password for SAP is going to change at the same time. If information is shared here, it's available to them in SAP. Uh, we allow self-service with this. So as, I don't know here if anyone here runs a small company and actually manages their IT themselves, but requests for password changes. I forgot my password. I can't get into the information even though my password, I swear it's correct. Those sort of requests come through all the time. Azure IT gives you a single service portal for all of these services to reset and manage your own identity. And it also gives you that single sign-on that we talked about before. So Azure AD is Microsoft's solution for this. Uh, it, it's, 
an incredibly well-used and well-deployed service. 85% uh, of Fortune 500 companies are using it today, and we support over 110,000 third-party applications, which is huge. That's you know your boxes, your Dropbox, uh, Salesforce, everything like that. So a huge number of applications are able to be authenticated using this service. Uh, we process about 1.5 trillion authentications since we launched Azure AD. And on average, we do about 1.3 billion uh, transactions or, or pings to the service every single day. Now, just before I dive into Office 365 and how identity works on Office 365, I want to just be really clear about something from Microsoft, because this is something that's caused a little bit of concern in the past. Um, Microsoft has two identity systems that we offer to the public, which is everyone here. We have our personal identity system, and that's Hotmail, Outlook, uh, with no organizational commitment. So your Microsoft ID is uh, tomb at outlook.com or at hotmail.com. And with that, Microsoft has a con contractual obligation with the end user to provide them a level of service and provide them with uh, the privacy and security that they need. Then we have the organizational account. And the organizational account is run by the company. It's administered by the company. And we have a contractual agreement with the organization as opposed to with the end users. So there's no interaction with micro from Microsoft to the end users. In this case, we're no, never going to send your end users promotional emails because they're using the service. We uh, very much limit the amount of exposure and messaging services that we have to end users as a result. Uh, it's centralized management for the admin. So if you have 100 users, you don't need to tell them to go and sign up individually. You can manage that service yourself using Azure AD. And we power all of our internal applications on this. So Dynamics, CRM, Azure, Office 365, they're all built on the Microsoft organizational uh, account. It also gives you that flexibility, though, um, that if you do want to use an org ID, uh, sorry, a, a Microsoft ID, you can do that in certain circumstances. So if you have Azure, or if you want to use Office uh, from a personal perspective, you can still sign in using a Microsoft account, but you're going to get far less service and far less functionality as a result of that. So we're going to focus today just on the organizational account side of things. And we're going to talk about three very different models that you can choose to deploy identity within your own environment here. And these models really came uh, about over time. We didn't introduce all three of these at the same time. So from the left, we really began with organizations storing their identity on premise. Uh, we started using things like System Center, an Active Directory installed on a Windows server within your organization. And when we had that directory stored on our servers, everything was fine until we really had this mobile revolution, until we needed to start accessing not just email, but services from, internal, uh, from inside the business on devices outside the organization. Uh, and we had small ways of doing this. We used to open up VPNs or little tunnels to people, or little holes, essentially, in our perimeter to let people in. Uh, we maintained external portals so that people could check their email address so that the IT had to manage themselves. And it wasn't necessarily great. So when bring your own device happened and people wanted to use their own device, they wanted to bring it into the workforce, we started seeing a lot of shadow IT, uh, unapproved people, uh, ways of communicating because IT just hadn't kept up. And suddenly, we needed to look at a hybrid world. Uh, we needed Intune, essentially, to allow people to authenticate on different devices, uh, no matter what they were, whether they were iOS or Android or Windows. And that led us to more of a hybrid model, where you had some of your, you had your directory data stored on premise, but you allowed people to access it by replicating that information in the cloud. And then we moved to a cloud model. There's a lot of businesses today, or young businesses today, that don't even employ an on-premise directory. They manage all of their directory in the cloud. And with that, you need to, um, we needed some services that can empower both rich clients, as in like Word, PowerPoint, and uh, Excel on your desktop, also the mobile applications, and allow people to pull APIs, to pull from random data sources that we didn't even know existed when we built the product in the first place. And people required a second factor of authentication. So they said, well, people are using mobile devices. I'm not even managing my directory on premise. I really want to make sure this is still secure. Let's do phone factor, which is I get a phone call when I log in, or I get a text message when I log in. And that was where cloud identity came in and some of the advantages that it provided. So the three models that we're going to go through today are a synchronized identity model, a federated identity model, and a cloud identity model. And there are two parts to this discussion. 
The first is where do we store the names of your users? So if you look at the bottom here, we have on-premise identity on the two left-hand boxes. Um, and that's where we're storing the information for your users. That's the first name and the last name and the password. Now, what's really important about this is that some companies don't want to put their users' identity in the cloud. We find that we have, uh, certainly overseas, not so much in the US, we have a lot of customers that say, you know what, I want to know who my employees are, but I don't think that Microsoft or potentially anyone else, if I have a, uh, a stigma about that, ha I don't want them to have access to the first and last names of my employees. And so that's why these two models are really important still, because there are ways that you can obfuscate and, and hide the names, essentially, from being in the cloud. Uh, and then the second part of this discussion is not just where the names are stored, um, because where the names are stored is also going to enable things like a people picker or uh, instant messaging or e uh, like internal email and searches for people's names, but also how do people sign in? How do we validate that access? Uh, if you have an existing directory on premise, uh, you can integrate Office 365 either through that single sign-on, the federated and the cloud identity model, but there are different ways for you to sign in depending on how you approach this model. And we're going to talk about those differences a little later on. Cool. So the first one I'm going to talk through is synchronized identity. Now, this is really simple, um, which is really great. And I, and I want to make sure, because it's a small room, if you do have any questions, feel free to put up your hand at any time. And, and we can stop. We can go back. We can go forwards. We can do anything like that, because we have time. So um, great example of a customer that uses synchronized identity is British Airways. Uh, they're a truly global company. I mean, they're, a, they're an airline. So they have employees that are all over the globe. And when you have employees that are all over the globe, they have different requirements around compliance and security and authentication in certain sub company, countries. They also don't necessarily trust every government that they work with in the countries that they operate in. So they want to make sure that they're keeping their data stored in a centralized location that's not where their end users are. Enterprise mobility was a really important point for British Airways as well. They wanted to be able to enable people to use their mobile phones and use their laptops and use their devices in different countries. And they had a lot of existing infrastructure. They didn't come out of nowhere. British Airways has been around forever. And they had an on-premise directory. They had VPN. They had different ways for people to access information. And they didn't want to just uproot all of that and move it to the cloud. They wanted to really see how they could use their existing infrastructure and really easily transition to using Office 365. So they chose to use synchronized identity. Synchronized identity is really simple. And it's exactly as the name suggests. I have all of my users' data on premise. And that's on the uh, right-hand side of the screen. I uh, synchronize it to the cloud using a tool called Azure AD Connect that keeps the database in sync every three hours. So we update the database with new users. We send that to the cloud. And we check if there's any changes that have happened in the cloud database. And we synchronize those back into, into the normal one. So we make sure that these are still in sync with each other. Um, and it means that we don't need to go back to your on-premise directory for passwords. We bring your password up to the cloud. And when we bring your password up to the cloud, we do something that we call hashing, which is a little bit like the Caesar cipher that we talked about earlier. It's where we take the information and we encrypt it further. Normally, when you put your uh, password into Azure, or sorry, into Active Directory on premise, we will hash the password. Sometimes it's MD5, which is a standard. Uh, sometimes we use other encryption technologies as well. But essentially, what that does is it turns something like the word password into a 25-letter uh, code. Uh, that you can't necessarily reverse. It's a one-way hash, and we'll go through that in a second. Um, to configure the synchronized identity model, all you need to do is have the on-premise directory, download Azure uh, AD Connect, and connect it to your Office 365 account. And every single person in your organization who previously had access to any of your internal tools now has access to Office 365. And we keep that all in sync all the time. Um, all services as well, once we've now brought, used the sync tool to bring it to the cloud, you can use SAP and Salesforce and everything like that and just synchronize it with that Azure Active Directory uh, replica of your on-premise database so everyone can use single sign-on. So password hashing. Uh, we've talked about that being on-premise, and we definitely do on-premises, sorry, and we do that on-premises all the time. Um, what we do though when we use Azure AD Connect is we do an additional level of encryption. So we, add, we hash it again using an even stronger technology. And then we send all of the password uh, hash details over an SSL encrypted connection both ways. So it's a very, very, very secure way of, of storing your passwords in the cloud. 
Uh, and I want to really press that because a lot of the reasons people use the federated identity model, which we're going to come to in a second, is that they don't trust us storing their passwords in the, crowd, in, in the cloud. But in reality, the cloud versions of your password in this case are even stronger than the hashed passwords that we have on premises. So it's a very, very secure way to store your passwords in the cloud. It's also non-reversible. So once it's gone one way, it's almost impossible to reverse a hash out and turn it into a password again. What we actually do when someone types in their password uh, using the front end is we hash it and we check that the two hashes match. So you never actually get a raw version of the password again. Does that make sense? So when should you use this? You should use this method when you already have an on-premises directory and you want to synchronize your user accounts and uh, optionally, as we talked about, the passwords. Uh, it also, uh, you should also use this if you know that you're going to eventually want to use federated identity. Uh, federated is the next step. It's a lot more complicated. It allows for a couple of additional scenarios, which we'll talk about in a second. But it's a good stepping stone if you want to get there. Uh, and the last thing is, you know that your Azure Active Direct or your, your on-premise Active Directory is in good health. If you know that that database is a really good representation of your users that you have today, you know that their passwords are up to date and their information is up to date, our express settings on Azure AD, AD Connect are going to work really well for you right out of the gate. And you can just get your uh, directory up into the cloud in no time at all. Any questions on synchronized identity? We'll move on. I think we'll have some soon. Yeah, go for it. Um, I have a couple of slides that are uh, using the Office 365 uh, directory. Mm -hmm. uh, they also have on-prem or split. Okay. Um, and they also are interested in just using a VM and Azure sure. uh, to use AD Connect. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, that's going to be complicated based on exactly what their setup is and why they've done it that way in the first place. I don't by know. Accident. Just by accident? Okay. Um, there are some tools, and have you used Azure AD Connect? Yes. Like, yeah, so there are some tools that we can do around, um, you know, duplicate checking and things like that as well, if, we, if you were going to just do a migration all at once. Um, and we can, I can talk you through these. I've actually got a set of resources at the end of the slide deck to talk through a couple of the different ones. It's safe to say that Sorry, Azure AD Connect with on-prem. Yeah, so you have on-prem, and yep. you have your AD Connect to 365 uh -huh. directory. Yep. Can you also do on-prem to an Azure AD? Uh, I wouldn't recommend it. In fact, I've never really looked at that scenario. Um, we can have a talk about that later, though. I would be using, if possible, just the Azure Active Directory service and trying to get everything into one point. And if we needed to upgrade the Azure Active Directory to a basic or a premium level so that you got those on-premise on-premises sort of services, that'd be the one you'd want to do. Yeah, yeah, we're going to talk about it. Cool, federated identity. So, um, great example of a customer that's using federated identity today is Aston Martin. Uh, so they needed a really secure and compliant way of connecting to, to Office 365, and they wanted to own more than just a single password for their collaboration. That's what we were talking about before. They wanted to have multiple factors of authentication. Uh, they had a small IT department. In fact, Aston Martin Worldwide only have 15 people that manage their global IT. And with the latest James Bond movie, they had a huge amount of interest in people trying to get access to their IT. In fact, they had uh, an incredible spike, something like 120 times failure rate for authentication in those months, which showed that people were really trying to get into, um, into it. And, and the failure rate is great. That's what we want to hear, that people weren't actually get, get, gaining access. And we're actually going to go through a couple of the tools that will help you find that out later on. So they chose uh, to do some group policies which kept their data secure. They wanted to make sure that only certain people within the company had access to certain information on certain devices at certain times. And some people, it was only when they were actually on the company's network and rather than being out in the field. And that's why they needed uh, to have a more complex identity structure. They chose to use hybrid, oh sorry, a hybrid identity model which is federated identity. And this one you'll notice looks very, very similar to the first one. Synchronized identity. And in fact, it really is very, very similar, just harder. Um, and so what you end up with is on an on-premises directory at the start of the process. We synchronize up the changes using Azure AD Connect as we did in the previous model. And we're still syncing your directory up there. What we're not doing by default is taking your passwords up to the cloud. We keep your passwords on-premise. And the reason for that is that we allow the client to go and uh, authenticate against your on-premises directory in this scenario. 
to make sure that we're keeping that information secure. Now, as we talked about previously, we do keep your passwords really secure in the cloud. In fact, we add all of these extra levels of hashing and, and salting to them to make sure it is. But there are certain companies that have compliance requirements or legal requirements, and they don't want to store their users' passwords in the cloud. So in this scenario, I'm a user. I've got my phone there. I send my login request to Office 365, and my password goes through Active Directory Federation Services, ADFS down the bottom, through to my on-premise directory. We validate that. We say, yes, this is right, and we send that to Office 365 to say, yes, they can go in and they can look at it. So Office 365 in this scenario never gets to see your password. So there's no right back and forth. We can, if you want. So there is an option for you to have a write back as a fallover. So if you decide that, um, if say with this connection down the bottom that we're looking at, your internet connection goes down, your proxy servers die, something like that, you may need for your users still to get access to their email. And in that scenario, what we have is this password sync as backup. So you can still switch quickly and easily over to a federated model where we do keep your passwords in the cloud. You hit a switch, and everyone can continue to access the information while we go about fixing your proxy issues in the back end. Obviously, we don't want for that to happen, but there are scenarios outside of everyone's control uh, that may impact your, your local server's connection to the internet at the time. Um, this is really great because it also allows you in a scenario where you're having to reconfigure or redeploy or test servers um, to just go and uh, set this up in the back end. And then once your servers are all configured and ready to go, you can switch back over to Federated Identity and everything remains in sync. Um, this is a really useful experience um, if you've got experienced deployment staff. Uh, you do have hardware requirements as part of this. You still need to maintain your on-premises directory. That on-premises directory could actually be stored in Azure in a virtual machine, as we talked about just before, but it's not really recommended. You'd actually want to have your own hardware there. Um, I've got some resources in here that I would recommend you read if this is something that appeals to you. And the reason you really want to be doing this is if you have compliance policies within your organization that require it. Maybe you're a legal uh, service or professional services firm that has highly classified information or uh, stores social security numbers and you're really not willing to take the risk with that. Uh, ADFS requires additional service to implement, so you need to plan your hardware requirements accordingly. You need to make sure you've got the money for it. Um, and third-party providers often don't support hash word sync. So, uh, password hash, sorry. So when we're talking about um, Azure AD, there are other people like Azure AD in the world. There's one login um, and people like that. And if you want to use a third-party service like that, then you are going to have to use federated identity as the model for setting up your office identity. Uh, if you want to use an existing multi-factor authentication technique, say you use smart cards in your organization and you already have the technology to power that, totally fine. Federated identity is the way to do it. And what it'll do is we store your directory in the cloud. When the password comes in, we reroute it to your multi-factor authentication. That says yes. Then it goes to your database with the password that says yes. Then we tell Office 365. So it's the way for you to really get in all those third parties and the more complicated ways of... of um, authenticating logins. And the last one we're going to talk about here is cloud identity. So um, this is a challenge that a lot of us are going to be familiar with. Uh, the challenges aren't necessarily unique. But we have GameStop, and they had more than 6,000 locations worldwide uh, and a really, really decentralized workforce. These were people that didn't even come into a central office ever. They went to different stores. They were sales reps and everything like that as well. Um, and the gamer experience thrives on loyalty. And to drive loyalty externally, they needed to have a really great way of collaborating internally and driving that loyalty internally. Uh, they also had uh, employees over different companies, so, uh, countries speaking different languages with different compliance requirements as well. Plus, they had a lot of existing infrastructure when it came to cloud services. So they were a fairly ad early adopter of the cloud, and they had an internal portal that was already built on Azure AD. It had all of the service uh, and the federation services. They had built a couple of their websites using uh, Azure uh, app services as well. And so they were already fairly invested in the Microsoft stack. And this is the cloud identity model. I love this because it's so simple. It really is this clean. It's the idea that the user sends their password to the service, and the service lets them in. And I know that's revolutionary. Uh, it's sort of what you'd expect a, a, in the first instance. But this is only really good if you don't have that existing infrastructure or if you're really willi willing to rip everything out 
and say, you know what, we're moving to the cloud. And I'm going to show you how you can really easily rip everything out and move to the cloud in a demo that we do later on today. But it does mean that uh, a lot of the existing hardware and the infrastructure that you've already built and already invested in is, is no longer relevant. So uh, this is really good if you have a distributed workforce. Uh, and especially if you have a mobile workforce, because by default, the cloud is built for a mobile first, cloud first world. You type in your password, we authenticate against the cloud, and you're in. Uh, it's really great for rich profiles with a distributed workforce. So if I never go into the head office, I previously worked at Microsoft New Zealand, and I didn't meet anyone in Microsoft Seattle or in Redmond. Uh, and the great thing about cloud identity is right off the bat, it allows for very rich profiles. So you've got pictures, you've got all the details, we've got all of the synchronized information from um, the cloud that we have in there, including what people are working on. So if I'm using Delve and if I'm using Office 365 effectively and tagging the work I'm doing, we can build profiles for these people that say where they're at and what they're doing and where they fit into the organization. Obviously, you can do this uh, with your on-premise directory, but because of the cloud, we can actually do that for you, and we're automating more and more of that directory building process, which means that people like me that work outside of the country can log in, can search for people like Brian, who was previously in my team. I can see what he's working on. I can see where he is. I can see his pictures. And then if you have a small IT department and a small budget, this is the option for you. You're, it's all in the cloud. You get Act, Azure Active Directory for free as part of your Office 365 subscription. There's no hardware requirements. We allow for multi-factor authentication right off the bat for free. So you can go in, download uh, Phone Factor or Microsoft Authenticator on your phone, and you've got a multi-factor authentication set up straight away with no third parties being involved. So much simpler, much easier, much cheaper. So we're going to go through a quick demo of this now. Uh, does anyone have any questions about that last identity model before I move on? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, so um, it depends what you choose to set it up with, and you can choose how much information you want to write back, uh, and you can also choose if you want to sync passwords. But the, the good thing about Federation is it's almost infin infinitely customizable. You get to choose just how much of a secure relationship you want to build between the two servers. So changing things like password usage or maybe using things that you would know So we don't have uh, all of the management options available within 0365. So you still need to have, um, be using, say, the Azure AD portion of the portal, uh, but you don't need to necessarily go into the Active Directory portal on premises. Does that make sense? So you still get all of the Active Directory features. They may not be surfaced within the admin portion of the Office 365 portal. That'll be in Ad Azure Active Directory. Cool. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, you can. So federated identity uh, doesn't work uh, with multiple forests today, but you can use Azure Active Directory. Sorry? Can they use stuff like I don't know what we've announced with Azure AD Connect. I'll need to double check for you, but if you want to leave your presence card with me, I can get back to you on that one. Yeah. Cool. So what I'm going to do is just duplicate my screen so you can see this. Oh. Right. Cool. And what I'm going to do is just log into the office Portal. So this will be familiar to most people here. Show of hands, has everyone here logged into office.com before? Yeah, great. So this is the, ad, uh, the normal portal for users. And I'm going to go into the administration portion just to show you uh, what, cloud, what managing cloud users looks like and just how quick and easy that is. So I'm going to go in here, go to my user portal. And I can go in, and right from the home page, I can go and add a member to my Azure Active Directory. I'm not going to do it uh, right now. Uh, but I can go through, I can put in first and last name, what I want it to come up as, set them as an email address, a location, some contact information. And these are all standard fields that we have in Active Directory. And assign them a license. 
Now, what's really great about this is you can see the list of users that I have in this tenant is already here today. And if I wanted to go and I said, you know what, I don't care about my existing on-premise infrastructure, I don't care about uh, everyone that already exists, I just want to move to the cloud, don't worry about sync tools to bring everyone up. All you need to do is have a CSV file and add people straight in. So I can go in here, I can import multiple users. We've got a template for you here, so you can actually download the template to make sure that the information fits in the digestible way. I'm gonna come in here, bring in my users, we'll verify that it's correct and that it's all in the right format. We'll check also as well that the domain name that you've chosen is the email address for all of your users you actually own and that you haven't made any mistakes with the domain name. Go through here, I can choose whether or not I want to allow them to sign in today or whether I want to delay that. Assign some product licenses, and I'm just gonna assign some E5 to everyone. I don't have enough licenses, it'll probably say no. Uh, and then it goes through and it'll add those users in there. And so this is me managing users in a really simple way in the cloud portal. Um, I've, now what I can do is I can also go in to Azure. So a show of hands again, how many people have actually ever logged into Azure? So, okay, good, so we're also got people in here that are using Azure as well. If you log in here and I go to my Active Directory, you will see all of the users that I previously had in that Office 365 portal represented in my Azure Active Directory as well. So these are always in sync. We're pulling all of your users for the Office 365 portal out of the Azure portion as well. And what this does is it gives you some really great tools in addition uh, to the tools that you have in Office 365 to manage those users. So some of these tools, we don't surface in Office, but there's some great ones in here like users that are at risk. We're bringing in here users that have overly simplified, overly simple passwords. Users, for example, that have logged in from strange locations recently, and they seem to be okay, but we're just gonna flag them as they may be at risk. This is also people that have changed their details recently. So have I gone in here and changed a whole lot of information out of nowhere? Not really malicious, but I've changed names and things that might be worth flagging as information that might be at risk. So I've got two users in here that are there. I've also got some risky sign-ins. So sign-ins that came from weird places in the world. Sign-ins that came from IP addresses that I've never seen before. Great. Now what I can also do within the Azure AD portal is I can go in here and I can connect a third-party application for me to use. Now when I'm adding a, a third-party application, this is Salesforce. We're talking about SAP. We're talking about all these other ones that we might want to authenticate with the same login. And I'm going to go in here to Enterprise Applications. Sorry, the uh, network here's a little slow. And uh, you can see I've already got a couple of applications in here. I've got Salesforce, but I'm gonna go through and show you just how quick it is to go and add a new application. So I'm gonna go in here. We've got all of the different applications that we support today all sorted in here. I'm gonna go and I'm gonna search for Dropbox for business. Dropbox for business, and I press add, and that's it. We've now added the application to our tenant, and now I need to just log in. We've got a little guide for, that's specific for every application, and we change that guide depending on what we've logged in, that lets you go and configure your single sign-on, that lets you authenticate and join those two tenants to make sure that we have the correct hooks in place, and sets you up to go. And it's that easy for every app that you wanna do. We're now managing identity for multiple services, which is really nice and simple. Another great fe feature about managing all of your identity through Azure AD is we also get the ability, and I'm just gonna bring it back up here, to go and customize things like the branding of our tenant and the login page as well. So in this case, really easily, I can go into company branding here. I'm gonna edit my company branding. I'm gonna attach some pictures, maybe a picture of Chicago and my company logo. Um, and I'm also gonna say that, you know what, I don't want my users to ever be able to stay signed in, because that's really important for me to not allow them to save their password details in the browser. Save that, and now I've updated the login page as well. So where you could always update your Office 365 look and feel with your logo and your template and your theme, you can now customize the login page as well. So Azure AD is a really powerful set of tools to manage the identity that's in the back end, but you need to make sure that you navigate to this from Office. So Office will give you a certain number of uh, features and scenarios that you can change. Azure AD is gonna really empower those even further. And at any time you want, you can always choose to upgrade these features. If you're looking at things like advanced threat protection, or if you're looking at a whole lot of um, 
Azure AD premium features like group-based licensing or enabling yourself to manage users in a bulk way, you can always go in here and manage those through Azure AD if you choose to upgrade your solution, uh, upgrade your subscription. Awesome. Cool. So uh, we have gone through uh, how you get your identities to the cloud. We've mixed the on-premise and the cloud identities for that P PC, mobile, web productivity scenarios. And we've also really had a, a little look at the cloud-based uh, cloud identities as well and how much e quicker and easier they are to use. Before we move on to sort of question and answers, I wanted to have a quick talk about what the future of identity looks like here. And a lot, a lot of the questions that I certainly get are around LinkedIn. Uh, LinkedIn is something that we, ha we purchased a little while back uh, for a vast sum of money. And um, there's really some great similarities between our two businesses. Uh, we have 1.2 billion Office users today, and they have 433 million members. And certainly Office looks at, uh, at our users like members. These are people who have invested in our software. They're people that log in and they use it every day. And we want to treat uh, Office users like they are members of a community. Uh, we have 70 million Office 365 monthly active users, which is a huge number. Uh, LinkedIn is listing 7 million job listings uh, all the time, oh, sorry, active job listings at the moment. Uh, they've got 9 million individual company pages, they've got 50,000 university pages, and they've got 2 million paid subscribers. These are people that are paying for services within the business. So these are really, really big um, sets of data that we now have access to as part of LinkedIn, but they've also got a really engaged and um, collaborative and productive community that we also want to tap into as well. And so when we talked about putting people at the center of identity, like we did at the very start of this presentation, we talked about having your events and your chats and your Word documents and your PowerPoint all around the single user. And that's where LinkedIn can come in. LinkedIn can really enhance that experience, where we've got your documents, We've got your uh, Windows life and the device life that you have as well. But then we also have your LinkedIn information from the LinkedIn graph. So things like what you're learning, what you're researching at the moment, who you're working with from outside the organization. If I'm emailing Jane from Contoso from Microsoft and I've never met her before, where does she fit in the organization? How can we help surface that information in a natural way within your Outlook experience? So where the people card is a contact card today, it's going to become much more of a person card in the future, where it's not just Jane Smith uh, from Contoso, but it says Jane Smith Contoso previously worked at focus areas, what she works on, so you understand that you're working with the right people in the right place. When we merge these two graphs as well, it'll also help you do better business with other people externally. You get to choose how much information you want to, to put out there publicly. When you're connecting with people externally, uh, internally every day, we can encourage connections on the web and we can encourage connections within LinkedIn. So that LinkedIn begins to function as your public uh, business profile or public commercial profile and your internal profile is managed within Office as well. And so you can synchronize the data that you have there, the projects that you are working on. And uh, that's all we have to talk about today, but in the next two months, you'll see some big announcements coming out of the LinkedIn team um, with some pretty cool new product features that they're going to be announcing. So next steps, and what I'd really recommend you guys do um, is I'd have a look at Microsoft Enterprise Mobility Suite. A lot of the scenarios we talked about today with managing mobile devices uh, through Azure Active Directory um, are really useful tools, but your business needs to know how to really use them, how to deploy them, and how to interact with them. Uh, visit TechNet and MSDN for some really good resources. The links in this presentation, which I'm going to publish, will actually take you directly to the identity pages as well. Uh, we have a couple of things that I would recommend. Uh, the first is uh, looking at our roadshow presentations. There are more resources in there today. And we also have a set of identity frameworks that you can visit on the website as well at IT Innovation. So I've got a descriptor for each of those three scenarios that we talked about today as well as a video that ties them all together. And then if you can rate the session, and then let me know if you have any questions. Feel free to tweet at me at any time. Um, the identity team is really highly engaged with us on the Office Network as well. So if you do have any questions, let us know, and we're more than happy to, to get those answered. Cool. Thanks so much, guys. Yeah.
It's a prereq if you want the process to be a whole lot easier. So when you use the IDFX tool, you'll essentially be able to go through and clear up the duplicates and the, and the out of whack sort of stuff there. Um, you have a couple of options. So if you were just going to move directly to cloud, you could export your Azure AD, clean it up manually using Excel, and then go from there if you wanted to. It is, it is, it's part of Office 365, yeah. And the links to those are all on the TechNet article as well. So if you need access to the ID Fix tool, which helps you clean up your on-premises directory, then you can go in there and, and, and use that. Great. Any questions? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. So you've synchronized to cloud and you want to disable um, Azure AD Connect essentially and decommission your on-prem? Yeah. yeah, sure. So you can, um, you can unsync using the Azure AD portal. You can remove the Azure AD Connect portion and then your database does remain in Azure, um, in Azure AD and you just choose to manage it in there going forward. You don't need to do anything additional. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If your UPN doesn't match, um, no, it's not going to convert it automatically. Um, so if you run the my UPN, yeah, I don't know actually what happens in that scenario. It, I don't think it. I think it would create a new user account. It's not going to match them up. Yeah. Yep, you need to run ID fix first. Yeah. Yeah, go for it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, what tools have you used to try and diagnose? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay, so it's, it's been escalated to Microsoft and they haven't a look at it. Yeah, um, so the one place I would recommend you go is network.office.com. There's an identity portal there. And if you put it in there, it, it sort of at least gets it officially on everyone's radars so that we can have a look and see what it is. Um, there's a really good session, which I've linked to in this presentation, around diagnosing authentication issues that was delivered by um, someone at Ignite and uh, Jonas, and he did a really, really good job of sort of saying these are the different tools that you can use at different stages. If you've worked with a Microsoft engineer, then you're probably ahead of that component anyway, but um, I'd highly recommend going and having a look at that presentation, which is linked to from this one, because it, uh, it, it sort of lays out exactly where you might want to do some traces and things like that and fiddle. Yeah, it seems bizarre to me as well. I wouldn't know. Yeah. Sorry, what's that? Yeah. I think you said it was an auto discover issue, right? I think so. Yeah. 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 As long as and you've definitely gotten a Microsoft engineer engaged. Perfect. That's the way to do it. Cool. Yeah. Go for it. It's not set up to do that. No. Yeah. So basically, I mean, our scenario is we have a home office that has a huge uh, database and uh, the Azure AD Connect yeah. to our current suite. Mm -hmm. We also manage the security for the domain because of our shared directory, so we've got domain office and secret private PC. Sure. They have to deal with and that's compatible with the main server for their uh, office and uh, directory control and all those security. 
Yeah. Why was it set up like that? Do you know? Well, we have, we have to put them on their own premises for a bit. Okay. Like e discovery is basically the one that yep. goes to the branches and all the ones that want to do it. Hopefully. Yeah, there may be a solution. Um, I'll connect you with someone who's a uh, identity escalation engineer who works in our services organization. Um, if he's seen a best practice around that, I'm sure he can let you know. It's not, it's not designed to do it out the gate, but there may be some workarounds you could implement. Yeah. If you've got a business card, I'm happy to take it and you can follow up. <laughs> we'll talk about that after. Cool. Anyone else? Awesome. Thank you so much for coming, guys. Um, feel free to connect with me on Twitter or to reach out after the session in the office network. I'm on the identity portal as well, so I'm more than happy to take your questions. Thanks.